Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're getting enthusiastic about words for family members, kinship terms. But first, we're looking forward to 2019. It's almost here. We're very excited to continue with the regular show, some exciting plans like uh, video episodes. We've had a really exciting 2018. We've done lots of really cool stuff. You've been along for the ride, and we're really looking forward to continuing with regular episodes and other exciting things in 2019. And we just hit our goal to make a special video episode about the linguistics of gesture, which is super exciting. It was also really great to have Gretchen in Australia when we hit the goal for the gesture videos. That happened while she was out on her trip to do the live shows. We had celebratory ice cream. It's very exciting. Yes. Uh, so that was fantastic. And we're looking forward to the next goal, which is going to be a special video episode interviewing a deaf linguist about the linguistics of sign language. So stay tuned for which sign language and which linguist we're going to be interviewing for that uh, once we hit that goal. Our latest bonus Patreon episode is a Q&A that we did while we were in the same geographic location, which you can find on patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Yes, as well as 20 previous bonus episodes, which is almost an entire double lingthusiasm. So you should definitely check that out if you haven't already. We also both have other exciting 2019 adventures. I am having a baby, <laughs> which we mentioned a couple of episodes ago. Uh, that will take up a fair amount of my 2019, I feel. <laughs> I feel like babies are, are pretty busy, but the episodes will continue as scheduled. Um, I have a book coming out in July 2019. Uh, so you will also hear... A book baby! A book baby! I wonder which one is going to be cuter. We probably shouldn't have that competition. <laughs> They're cute in their own ways. <laughs> one of them will eventually learn to talk back and it won't be the book. So if you want to see what the cover looks like and for pre-order information, you can check out the link in the show notes or on my website as well. So Lauren, here's an important linguistic question. What are you going to have your baby call you? Are you going to be a mama, a mum, a mummy? I haven't I haven't thought about this, which means I guess that I'm just going to go with my socio-cultural norms, so probably going to be mum. Okay. That's 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 very standard. Yeah, seems legit. Some I mean I yep. I had some friends who've like had, you know, called their parents or had their kids call them by like their first names. Oh yeah, that always seems really weird to me. If I call my parents by their first name, it's because we're having some kind of like very silly conversation. I think I only do it if I'm like at a grocery store or a park or something and I need to catch their attention and like saying mom or dad isn't working. And so I'm like, <laughs> I guess I should say their name to get them to turn around. Maybe that's a thing you could do. I love it's such a conscious decision for you. <laughs> uh, definitely not part of my norm, but it is part of some people's norms. Uh, yeah, I know people whose kids call them by their first name just because they find the idea of being mum or dad really weird. And I also know people who find the idea of being mum or dad weird, and so they go by something like mama or papa or, you know, things or like that. Or they have some kind of cultural, you know, I have people whose families have Italian heritage, so they're mama or papa. I knew someone at school who had a grandmother, but her friend at school had a nonna, and she was like, well, that word sounds cooler. And so she just started calling her very Anglo-Australian grandmother nonna, even though there's no like family history of Italian naming in their family. <laughs> that's, that's very cute. It was really cute. Um, so sometimes people will deviate from, you know, every family kind of has its own idiosyncrasies and sometimes they pop up in the kinship terminology that people use. And I think especially for grandparents, um, those those seem to be a little bit more idiosyncratic, whether cultural or they're just kind of more names for, for grandparents. Like mama and papa and dada seem to be very common across different languages, whereas, you know, whether you say nana or nonna or opa or oma or these kinds of things tend to be a bit more different. We have both a grandfather and a pop mm. in terms of my grandparents. Yeah, I had, well, granddad and, and papa, and then for the grandmothers, uh, Mimi and Gigi, which were both kind of idiosyncratic names. Mimi and Gigi? Yeah. <laughs> my... Where did they come from? <laughs> well, 
So Gigi comes from the fact that that grandmother was named Gretchen, uh, who I was named after, and so Gigi huh. stands for Grandma Gretchen. Uh, and her oh, that's grandmother. That's so great. That's like lovely and meta. Yeah. And her grandmother was also named Gretchen, who she was named after. So she had a right. Gigi. And so sometimes she'd say, well, mm. my Gigi, blah, blah, blah. And so I've always known in kind of a weird way that if I had grandkids, I already have a grandma name. Wow. That's a lot of presupposition Be- there, Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> because clearly I have to continue the tradition of Gigi if I have kids, if I have grandkids. <laughs> That's a um, really nice story. Yeah. And Nimi, I apparently, at around, you know, the age of one or two, gave this name to my grandmother because I was the oldest grandkid on this side. Um, and that's uh, what I apparently started calling her and it stuck. Cool. You you created language change within your family. I was pre-linguist. <laughs> <laughs> You're a linguist innovator. Yeah, but my grandmother, Mimi, used to joke that Mimi and Gigi sounded like two little French poodles or something like this. They do. <laughs> it's very cute. I think, especially in English, kids often end up creating or using different terms from different cultures because it's really useful in a family context to be able to distinguish between maternal and paternal grandparents. And yet, this is not something that English has built in words to do, whereas other languages do. Yeah. And when you start looking at... Um, so like we have all these different things that we call different members of our family, so different kinship terms, and we start looking at how kind of different parts of the family get segmented up and what different languages and cultures pay attention to. You start to realize that some languages kind of lump together a whole bunch of people that we might separate out into different terms, or English is very good at lumping together groups of people that have distinct kinship terms in other languages and cultures. And it's always really fun to learn those different systems and kind of start thinking about how your family relate to each other in different ways. Yeah, I haven't really, you know, most of the languages that I've worked with have been European, so I haven't done a whole lot with languages of other kinship terms. But there's some different forms in Shuba, right? Yeah. So when I'm in Nepal, when people ask about my family, I suddenly have to start thinking about, um, for example, like aunts and uncles it varies depending on whether they're your uncles on your dad's side or your uncles on your mother's side. And so in Shuba, your Ao is your father's brother and your Mm -hmm. Ashang is your mother's brother. So your uncles on each side have different names. And then in terms of your aunts, there's actually a whole bunch of different terms. So the aunts on your mother's side all get called Ama, which is the same as the word for mother. Oh, interesting. And so you distinguish them by saying ama chombo or ama chimi, which means your big mothers, so your aunts that are older than your mother, and then your ama chimi are your aunts on your mother's side that are younger than your mother. Oh, so that's also distinguished, the older versus younger side. Yeah, and it's not that it's not that people don't know, like, you know, just to make it clear, it's not that people don't know that their mother is different from their aunt. <laughs> it's just that's... <laughs> That's how the system – like, I I know that my uncles on my dad's side are different to my uncles on my mum's side. I just don't think about it that much day to day. And something that I find particularly interesting is that English doesn't distinguish between uncle by marriage or aunt by marriage versus uncle and aunt that are actually your blood relatives. No. So, I mean, personally, I have a distinction, I guess, between uncles and aunts that were already in the family when I was a kid – yeah. And the ones that have subsequently married my uncles or aunts after I got older. Yeah. Because the ones that were in the family when I was a kid, I call them all uncle and aunt and that's fine. And the ones that showed up when I was already, you know, a teenager or towards adulthood, I'm like, I just call them by their names because I didn't have that kind of I mean, they were first introduced to me, I guess, as this is the, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or, you know, person that so-and-so is dating. And so I, you know, spent a couple of years knowing them just by their name for that reason. And then when they got married, I didn't switch over to calling them uncle or aunt, even though technically they are. But somehow that doesn't work for me in the same way as the ones that I've known as part of the family ever since I was a kid. It's like for you, the terminology involves some kind of entrenchment within the family system. Yeah, or like, you know, did I know you as a child or something like that seems to be the factor, which is definitely not a factor that's officially encoded into any kinship system I've ever encountered, but seems to be encoded into my personal kinship system. (laughs) Um, Which always makes these things more interesting. (laughs) 
Yeah, there's the kind of official kinship systems, and then there's the personal idiosyncratic kinship systems. Yeah. But there are languages that have different terms for relatives by marriage as well. Yeah, so your aunts on your mother's side are your ama, but if it's your father's brother's wife, it's tsitsi, mm -hmm. whereas your aunts who your father, who are like your father's relatives, so younger sisters, are ani. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so you know who was married into the family, as opposed to who was a sister of your father. And there's more terms on the aunt side than on the uncle side. Because aunts can marry into families or marry out of families. So it's it's uh, in this culture, it's the women who move house when they get married. Okay. And so your uncles are always around, whether they're your father's brothers or your mother's brothers. Whereas women aren't bringing uncles into the house necessarily. Oh, I see. Okay. They're less important to you. Your, your uncles-in-law, are you're going to have less contact with them, so they don't have a distinct term for them. Yeah. We could say uncles-in-law and aunts-in-law. I don't know why we don't. I find the whole in-law terminology in English very confusing. If I were going to fix English. <laughs> <laughs> You'd fix the in-laws? Um, the kinship system does need a bit of a makeover. And the in-lawing is very confusing because, I mean, to me it's confusing because so many people in my family have long-term partners who aren't married. And so mm. I like to refer to them as outlaws. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people use the kind of outlaw terminology as a kind of jocular version of in-laws. But it does kind of upset my grandparents. <laughs> um, <laughs> See, my family says outlaws it, it all the time and it's fine. <laughs> Whereas it amuses me that, like, say, my brother's partner ha technically has the same terminology as my partner's sibling's partner. Yeah, that double layer. Maybe there should be, like, in-law-in-law. -in like, brother-in-law-in-law -in -law should be the one that's, like, two steps from you. Yeah. Or just, like, I guess it depends on how close you feel to people <laughs> as well. <laughs> I generally don't refer to my sister-in-law. I just refer to her by name. Yeah. I mean, that's fair, too. It's a bit like the, the aunts and uncles thing. It's like, it's too hard to assimilate you into my pre-existing kinship structure. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, because, I mean, presumably, especially if your siblings are having partners, you know, assuming that you're fairly close in age to your siblings, you're probably encountering those partners. You know, you've already kind of gone through your childhood acquisition of who your family is, and then suddenly your sibling is bringing in somebody new, and it's like, at what point do you switch over to that? Is it when they start living together? Is it when, you know, do they have to have a formal wedding? Like, where where do these things sort of change? So maybe that's part of the, you know, idiosyncratic system. So we've distinguished some cultures have terms that vary depending whether it's on your mother or father's side, terms that differ depending on if someone's older or younger. And again, Shuba distinguishes siblings that are older or younger. So older sister is Adzi, but younger sister is Nomo, and older brother is Ata, and younger brother is No. Mm. So when people ask me about my family, they ask, you know, do you have siblings? And I can say, yes, I am older sister. And it like immediately, immediately I have to say, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. I immediately situate myself in my family structure. And so if you say older sister, that means that you're the oldest. Yeah. Because that's what your siblings call you. Yeah. Like, if people say, you know, do you have any brothers or sisters? And I say, I have two siblings. I think that immediately implies, okay, they're different genders. Because if I had two sisters, I could just say I had two sisters. It would be, for an English speaker, you are giving an insufficient quantity of information by using sibling. Yeah, I was giving a less informative answer than I could. Yeah. You know, my, my sister and I both say, oh, yes, I have two siblings. But my brother says, I have two sisters. And this always surprises me because I think of myself as being one of siblings. I don't think of myself as being one of sisters because I have siblings. I don't have sisters. But of course, you know, it, at some point, at some point it breaks down. So, Which brings us to, you know, some cultures focus on defining kin terms by gender. And we do for some, like a lot of terms in English. So, like, your parents get distinguished by gender, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, but not everyone does, and so cousins is a good example of that. Siblings is a good example of that. Yeah, cousins is especially interesting because English has this kind of elaborated cousin system, and yet for a lot of people it's fairly obscure, and they're aware of the terminology involved, but they don't actually kind of know how to apply it. I'm in contact with a fairly extended range of my family, and we all 
have just agreed at some point to just refer to each other as cousins. And if someone's really curious about why I have a 60-year-old cousin in Canada, I will kind of talk them through the family structure and I can kind of calculate out second cousins and once removed But um, I, or, or we just end up using cousins because it's so much easier and we really aren't very good at calculating it. I mean, I have this very distinct memory for cousins, which I don't have for other terms, of when I was about nine or ten and I had been seeing a bunch of, you know, one corner of the family tree kind of sitting down and calculating how all of the once removes and how all of the first and second cousins thing worked. And when I did that, I kind of memorized which of people were which and which people weren't. So I call them all cousins. Like, I'm not like, you know, hi, second cousin Bill, because (laughs) I don't think anyone really does that. Um, But I can also be like, oh, you know, I have a cousin in Australia, and he's actually my first cousin once removed because he's my mom's cousin. And so there's a removal of generations. But yeah. I've had to explain this system to adult native English speakers who, in principle, you'd expect to know the kinship terms of our own language, but the cousin system... And, like, learning them at nine or ten is very late in language acquisition. Like, a lot of kin terms we learn really early on. They're some of our first words. Especially for family terms. Yeah, like, it's one thing to be learning, like, the extended number system. Like, maybe you don't know what a quadrillion is at age nine or ten, or you don't know some of the more you know, technical vocabulary or business jargon or these kinds of corners of the lexicon. But kinship terms are very basic and they're often learned really early. Um, And this brings me to one of my favorite uh, kind of cross-linguistic studies, which is the one that finds that mama and papa are words that children use to address their mothers and fathers, some of the very, very first words uh, across a whole bunch of languages that are completely unrelated. Yeah, this is one of those, like, it seemed so obvious when I first learnt it, kind of facts about language. Yeah, uh, about 60 years ago, the American anthropologist G.P. Murdoch did this survey of over 500 cultural groups around the world. And so he found that about half of societies use some sort of combination of ma, me, na, ne, no to mean mother. And another half, not necessarily the exact same societies, uses some combination of pa, po, ta, or to to mean father. So mama, me, me, na, na, ne, ne, papa, ta, ta, these kinds of things. And he's like, this is a weird coincidence. Why? So linguists get really caught up in historical linguistics trying to use the relationship between lots of current languages to trace back an older language. And so... Some people thought, like, maybe this relates to some kind of fact of history, but Roman Jakobson had a completely different theory, um, and one that I find really compelling, which is that when you have an infant and they're learning to use their mouth, they are going to start with the sounds that are the easiest to make. And the very easiest sounds to make are exactly those sounds that you mentioned in Murdoch's paper. Especially, you know, ah uh, is very easy. You can scream it. Many other sounds aren't very screamable. Um, babies can scream it. Uh, and ma, pa, the sounds that involve your lips are also very, very easy to make, very straightforward for the baby to learn to make. It doesn't involve as much control as using the tongue or further back in the throat. And it's just a straightforward open and close thing. So you're not trying to do bits of vibration or bits of frication or other types of more complicated things. And, you know, maybe the baby can see what their parents are doing when, they, you know, you can see that someone else is using your lips. Um, and so he figured it's kind of a property of babies, but it's also a property of parents thinking, I'm so important in my child's life. Clearly, this baby's saying my name. It's a, it's a kind of self-reinforcing fact across generations where parents are like, oh, like take what is essentially a child babbling and learning how to use their mouth as they're talking to me, they're saying my name. <laughs> they're saying my name. Uh, which I think is is also kind of beautifully human of it, in a very yeah. different sort of way. Which is why even though we say the proper English names are mother and father, if you ask people what their children's first words were, you'll often get them saying, oh, she said mama, uh, even though that's not what we think of as the normal English term. When it, we, we accept very low standards from children in those regards. It's very... It's very charming. 
Um, and it's also kind of interesting that Mama and Papa are a lot more common as first names than Amam and Apap, which are, you know, made out of the same sounds, but putting a consonant and then a vowel is much easier. Is, is much easier. And some languages don't let you begin words with vowels, but every language will let you begin a word with a consonant and end it with a vowel. Or some languages won't let you end a word with a consonant, but consonant vowel is a good basic syllable in every language. So ma is a better word than am, and pa is a better word than up um, for babies to learn and for languages to produce. So you do, you don't get up up and am am, you get mama and papa. I'm going to go from talking about some of the most primary and kind of parentally instinctual vocabulary about kinship um, to sharing some really cool stuff in Australian languages. Because one thing I find really interesting is when you have a culture that over time manages to create these incredibly elaborate and complex kinship systems. You know, I think in some ways our inability to process words for cousins to kind of potentially a bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? Like we don't use these terms very much because we don't really talk about or track our extended families very often in our culture. Right. But in cultures where people are less likely to kind of move to cities and are more likely to have larger families and continue living in the same villages with uh, or areas with lots of extended family around, it's useful to have words to distinguish between all these different kinds of relationships, especially to prevent people from having kids with people who are too closely related to them, which is, you know, useful for the continuation of the human species and shows up in different cultures a lot. And so when you have cultures that have been together, like living in close-knit, complex societies for generations and generations, you can get some really cool kinship stuff, and Australian languages seem particularly well disposed to this. So one thing that's really nifty is people calculate harmonic generations. So this is where to kind of use your family as a as an example of what a harmonic okay. generation is. In some ways, your lineage of Gigi's is an example of harmonic generations where grandparents and grandchildren are treated with the same oh. kin term or treated as being part of a cohort together. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I guess it's kind of the case in English in the sense that they both get the prefix grand, whereas, yeah. you know, you don't have that for parent, child, mother, father, daughter, son. They don't have the prefix, whereas grandchild, grandparent have a like a symmetrical prefix. And so in the one year language, the term for grandparent can actually be used reciprocally to refer to a grandchild as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. There's a really nice paper on that that I'll link to in the show notes. Um, another really interesting thing is all of the relationships we've been talking about so far have been about my relationship with another person mm -hmm. or your relationship with another person. And a lot of kin terms, you kind of start with the individual in the kind of center of the diagram and you're like, you know, my aunt is about my relationship with this person. Right. Or my grandparent or my grandchild is about my specific relationship with a specific individual. And then, you know, my grandparent is not your grandparent. Yes. Because we're not related to each other. That is true. Um, <laughs> whereas tri-relational kin terms are terms that encode three different relationships. Okay. There are reasons why these come into being, but I'll kind of give you an example of one first. Okay, I can't even visualize this right now. Well, it's, the good thing is there is a visualization. There'll be a link to this article by Joe Blythe. So in Murumpata, there is a term that is used by a male speaker when talking to their son or daughter mm -hmm. about the son or daughter's grandmother on the other side of the family. Okay, okay. So it's not saying – it's it's not a word for – my mother-in-law. Right. And it's not a word for your grandmother. It's a word that specifically means... Your opposite side grandmother. Your opposite side grandmother. Your, your grandmother who is not my mother. Yes. And is it like a prefix that's used for any of the relatives on that side? No, there are entirely different forms depending on different relationships. So for your son or daughter's maternal grandparent on the other side of the family. And the reason that tri-relational kin terms like this one evolve is because there are taboos within the culture on men being able to speak to or about their mother-in-law. Ah, okay. So that explains that one. But there are other tri-relational kin terms that don't have to do with these taboos. It's just about triangulating everyone in the relationship. I mean, I guess that kind of makes sense 
in the sense that so like when I'm talking to especially younger relatives, like ones that are little kids, I might yeah. refer to my own mother as aunt whatever if I'm talking to my young cousin. Yeah. Because I know that if this kid is two or something, they don't quite understand how all of the complex kinship terms work. So I'm going to use the term that places myself in their position. Yes. Or especially if you see a young child and you're like, where's mommy? You don't mean where's your own mom. You mean where's the child's mom? <laughs> yeah. So we can, we can do these triangulations. We just do them in our own head and position ourselves like the other person. Right. And we don't have an additional set of vocabulary for it. This is an entirely separate set of vocabulary to help navigate okay. the three-way relationship. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's super interesting. I can definitely see why that would be useful in certain circumstances, especially if you have kind of a complex network of kin. So, like, there are complex words that are encoded into the language that aren't encoded into ours. But there are also mm -hmm. examples in Australian languages where these kind of things get encoded into the grammar as well. So oh, interesting. in Lardil, there is, coming back to this harmonic generations thing, I will use a different pronoun if I'm talking about me and someone in my own generation or me and my grandparent compared to me and my father or my child because the father or child are not their disharmonic generations, whereas my right. siblings and my grandparents and my grandchildren are my harmonic generations. Oh, that's interesting. And so there are entirely different pronoun forms depending on whether I'm referring to a group of people in my harmonic generations or non-harmonic generations. There's a whole paper on this that I really love um, from Nick Evans back in 2003 that I'll link to. The thing I really love about it is that Evans refers to this kind of phenomenon as kintax. Kintax. Oh, that's really good. Where the kinship system is so ingrained into the language that it becomes part of the grammar. The kinship system is in the syntax. It's kin tax. Yeah. But actually, it sounds like a kind of tax that you, you know, fee that you impose upon your family <laughs> a little bit. Only if you're not thinking with your linguist brain. <laughs> Only if you're not thinking with your linguist brain. Kin tax. That's really good. Um, Another linguistic system that I find really interesting that kind of encodes family relationships in a different sort of way is the situation in Icelandic. So Icelandic speakers will have names like, um, so you might get Leif Erikson, who is the son of Eric the Red, which is a famous, you know, Viking. And then. Oh yeah, Eric's son. Sorry. Who's literally the son of have Eric. To yeah. Point out the obvious. But then Leif's son doesn't become something, something also Erikson. He becomes, I don't know, like Sven Leifson. And this system is kind of vaguely familiar to English speakers because we have names like Davison and Peterson and Johnson and stuff like that that have the sun in them, but they're no longer active. There was a recent History of English podcast episode where Kevin Stroud looks at how this changes in the Middle English period. So we did have, you know, you would be... You'd be Christopher Robertson, and then you'd have William Christopherson, who would then be having children who were like Thomas Williamson. But then eventually those names froze. And the whole idea of surnames is kind of really central to English and really weird to Icelandic people. Yeah, whereas in Icelandic, all of these get created. And so you also have the equivalence of, you know, like Leif's daughter. She's not going to get the last name Leif's son. She's going to be Leif's daughter. Yeah. And in Icelandic, when you refer to someone, you know what their father's name is, or sometimes their mother's name if they get named after their mother there. So they don't have the custom of referring to people by their surname in formal contexts. So like political leaders or dignitaries in Iceland, the correct formal way to refer to them is by their first name, because the only context in which you would use so-and-so's son or so-and-so's daughter is when you're saying the full name, not as a replacement for their name. I love that everyone's been on a name bender at the moment because obviously with an imminent human to name, so have I. But there's also a great <laughs> illusionist episode recently where Helen Zaltzman chats to some people in Iceland about their naming conventions and about the, the way that surnames aren't static, but they change with each generation. Yeah. And like, I found the Iceland thing really interesting because I realized that in the context where, you know, I'm figuring out like who all my second cousin once removed are, I also generally know when I'm introducing myself in a kind of family reunion context, like which of my family members I need to name in order for the person I'm talking to and I to figure out how we're supposed to know each other. Yeah. 
So, like, I don't have this encoded in my name anywhere, except for the fact that I happen to be named after my grandmother. But, like, this is it's part of conversation, even in a more limited context. Yeah, going to family reunions or weddings, and then I'm Lauren Chris's daughter. Yeah, exactly. Or, like, who are you here for in this wedding? Like, which side of the wedding are you here for? Even if you're not a relative, you can be like, oh, well, I'm so-and-so's friend from, like, you know, university. <laughs> yeah, um, that's putting you in, in the extended non-kinship group. Yeah, or like at academic conferences, you're like, oh, well, I'm so-and-so's adv- advisee. And they're like, oh, I know so-and-so, or like <laughs> the kind yeah. of extended networks. So humans have this need to kind of triangulate where they sit within social relationships. Yeah, absolutely. It's also interesting. I was intrigued to learn when researching this episode that the word sibling in English is both fairly new and also very old. Hmm. New in terms of its current use? So, yeah, so it comes from Old English. Um, Sib is actually related to the word for self. But in Old English, sibling is just any family member. And then in the early 1900s, 1903, geneticists started talking about inheritance. And they were like, guys, it's getting really annoying to keep saying brothers and or sisters this whole time. It'd be really great if we had a gender neutral term for this umbrella category, because inheritance doesn't care. Yeah. And so they like reached into Old English and pulled out this term that had meant any relative and started using it to mean brother and or sister. Useful. Uh, I I was like, this seems like a totally unremarkable word for me. It's, you know, totally part of my active vocabulary. I didn't acquire it when I was 10, like, you know, third cousin once removed. And yet it's a surprisingly recent innovation. I didn't realize it was that recent, but one recent-ish innovation that I've enjoyed bringing into my vocabulary is a word on analogy, which is instead of saying nieces and nephews all the time, saying nibblings. That's fantastic. I like nibblings a lot. Which has the double benefit of being cute. And it was first used in a 1951 article by a linguist who was talking about kinship terms across languages and was like, look, a gender neutral term like sibling is really handy. So I'm just going to coin nibbling while we're at it. That's great. I've also been seeing some people who are non-binary or genderqueer trying to come up with terms for like, oh, well, one of my siblings is having a child. I want that kid to call me something, but I don't want to be called aunt or uncle. So what other term can I come up with here? And I've seen a couple examples. I don't think there's one kind of nibbling go-to yet, but there's a bunch of options like uh, pibbling, parent sibling. Oh, I like pibbling. <laughs> it's kind of cute. It works very well in analogy. Or portmanteaus like auntle or uncle. Um, I've seen auntie, which is kind of like uncle and auntie. Oh, yeah. Or titi, which is, I think, based on the Spanish tio and tia are used for uncle and aunt, respectively. Yeah. And so titi is like combining those. Or zizi, similarly, for zio and zia, which is the Italian equivalent. And we've seen lots of examples of individual families innovating terms. So I feel like if the system isn't working for you within kinship, making it work for you and your family, however it's structured, is is a great idea. Yeah, I think it's very easy to make it catch on an individual family. Because if you tell a kid, like, here's what to call me, the kid doesn't know any different. Like, it works great for grandparents, and I think it should work really well for other family members as well. But it'll be interesting to kind of keep following that, because maybe in another generation or two, people will be like, what do you mean pibbling was only invented in the 2000s? Like, it's clearly part of my active vocabulary. You mean nibbling and pibbling and sibling were all once innovative? Which I think is a really interesting corner of the lexicon. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include hyperforeignisms, multilingual babies, and a QA and a with both of us. You can also help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producers are A. Prevo and Sarah Dapirala. Our editorial manager is Emily Greff. And our production assistants are Celine Yoon and Fabian Enderberg. And our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. Lingthusiastic.